It is appropriate to cap it up with an overview. And we have a great guy to do this overview for us, uh, Didier Kelo. Uh, and I'm very thankful and uh, happy that he's here with us. Because, as you know, um, he knows the field better than uh, most anyone. Um, he was the person who, together with Michel Mayer, discovered the first uh, exoplanet around the solar type star. The physicists took a long time to uh, acknowledge that they have to give a Nobel Prize for that, but eventually they did it. Uh, but that's besides the point. The point is that Didier knows both the past and uh, the current state of the field extremely well, and what I really hope that he is going to do is uh, now that all of you biologists know what exoplanets are and how we do it, uh, I'm really sure that he will get a glimpse of the future. And then when we talk about uh, the rest tomorrow and the rest of the week, uh, just remember what Didier tells you about that future. So, Didier, the <laughs> Thank you. Podium is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank, thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm really sorry to have missed this morning, but I could not make it at all. It was impossible for me, so I don't really like doing that, but okay, it is happening. So I will try to do an overview. It is not a review, so don't expect to get the highlights of all the papers. And my, my point here is try to give an overview for people not familiar with the field what is going on, and I call it science, it's not only just a topic, I think this is really so big that finally it becomes a kind of a standalone uh, theme, and uh, this is really the idea. It's a bit of a selected uh, punchline of what I do believe is um, the learning we have, um, I mean we have assembled on this field, and give you a little bit of my, my, my views or more kind of a glimpse of what is to be expected in the future in connection with what is going on um, during that, that week. Um, okay, so what are we trying to do here? Well, I think I, it's quite simple in a way. So if you've been asked why you're doing what you're doing, I think this is, I believe, what you should answer. So there is really four or three big questions right now that we're trying to get an answer. The first one is how to plan for and evolve. I think this is far to be understood uh, in, the, in general sense, I mean, we have a good understanding of um, the history of the solar systems, but when you leave the solar system and you start looking at plenty of other planets, it becomes a bit more confusing here. So can we establish what we um, call universal model for planetary system here? Um, how much I mean, the diversity, how much do we know on the diversity? So you have, you have seen already that there's been quite a lot of uh, surprises in the field. So the whole idea is how do you set in perspective the solar system against these other, other, um, other uh, solar systems? Um, there's something interesting which is this kind of uh, anthropocentric or I think we, we, there's life here and, and then we're looking at the universe and in a way we are in a very special configuration here. It's something we always have in the back of the mind and we should keep it always. This is why I think this relation with the other planetary system is something that has to be acknowledged every day. So if you work on the field you have to always recenter yourself and I always think we are in a, maybe a special configuration here compared to the many configurations available in the universe. And then the big question, the reason why we're talking about that, is there life elsewhere? We know there is life on, uh, on this planet. We know one kind of life, there's not any other kind of life so far being found. There may be other kind of life we're going to find in the solar system on another planet or on uh, some satellite of a giant planet in the future, but why know this is not happening? This is quite a profound question when you think about that. When you think about the universe uh, in, a, in a global sense, and why the universe is making life. Why at some point matter becoming alive? And is it something embedded into the law of physics that drives you into this, uh, this element here? And this is what we're trying to do. So we're doing physics, actually, but physics connected to the chemistry and the biology, and that I will come back on that. So understanding the origin, which is what happened on Earth, which is something that we can study in great detail because we have so much life here, Fortunately, it's life after, four and a half, after three and a half billion years evolution, so it is kind of a challenge here. So how far can we detect life elsewhere? I mean, how much can we say about this? And possibly maybe other kind of life, if we know what, what it means and how to find this. 
So this is the three topic I think we all addressing in various way, and this is why this talk this field is so exciting. Okay, let's go to the foundations. So go very very simple to the foundations. So to me, there is two foundations here where we're building on, and the first one is this. We have the solar system planet. We like it or not, this is the best ever system we will have for a long, long, long time. And I think we should really keep that in mind, that anything we do in the solar system is helpful for what we believe may be extrasolar planets. We're using a lot of solar system, we're using the same terminology, we're using Super Earth, Mini Neptune, Mini Jupiter, Super Jupiter, we always relate it to that. Well, there is an implicit bias when you do that, because you project into this planet. So this is an interesting point to remember, but we have to live with that. And the interesting bits of that is uh, the, the structure of the planet. I mean, in terms of physics, it's fascinating why do you get so much diversity here. It's not obvious when you look at this at first sight. Uh, but actually, we do have a good model for formation of planet, planet in the solar system. Unfortunately, this model applies essentially on the solar system planet mostly, and it's difficult to project outside without a couple of tricks that you need to add into the model. The key here, we all understand that the planet is a build-up mechanism in a sense that you start with some kind of core and you accrete and you add stuff on the top of it. This is really the assumption everybody is making right now. You know the challenge when you talk with stars and road graph, it's not a set of questions about what is your limit. I will not talk about that, but in a way, if you use the solar system as a proxy for what an exoplanet should be and uh, expect to be, you're making implicitly these assumptions, and it has a consequences on the way you see the formations. So this is the first foundation we have right now, and there's a lot, a lot of fascinating work. So I'm a great supporter of the space missions, exploring uh, the planet in the solar system and satellite in the solar system for that reason. The second one is we can see that kind of image. Well, it's one of the many, there's plenty, plenty of images of that kind when we do. And it's quite fascinating, I mean, frankly, to me, it has been a shock when I saw this image. It's a completely change of paradigm. You can talk about this, you can detect this, you can do, uh, um, I mean, you can detect the energy um, of the disk, uh, but, but when you start doing that, it's just completely another world. It's like taking a picture of the Earth and seeing the continent and seeing what's going on. So we do that, that's a thermal image, in that case, it's, it's a dust, but you can detect some, some of the, some of the, um, the gas as well, there's many things you can detect. And when you combine all this, you come up with this fascinating element. I'm sorry you don't see it, because what is relevant here is not just to do a pretty picture, which is fascinating here, there's a lot of interesting dynamics going on, but you can dwell into this disk and look what is inside. And what you don't see very likely here from your seat is the different layer of uh, phase transitions between the gas and the solids that rise to this kind of snow limit. Um, the CO2, water, CH4, and so on, and so on, and so on. This is very, very critical for the formation of the planet because there is way more gas than solids, uh, and when you transition the gas into a solid, then you end up with a massive amount of solid objects, solid particles, pebbles, and snowflakes uh, outside the planet, uh, outside um, the, the snow, uh, snow line distances. This is why we have this good model of formation of giant planet, because it's so easy to get a lot of stuff building the core pretty quick, just by the nature of the phase transition of the gas, which is much more numerous than the solid. So this trick between solid and gas is really the kind of a key drivers into the formation of the planet we understand so far. There's a lot of work on that. I mean, it's fascinating, and both in theory, both in detailed chemistry of this disk, I'm not going to dwell on that, but, but this is a topic by itself, which is fascinating, especially because of the, um, the equipment we have, such as ALMA, um, to, uh, to get into this kind of object. We also this uh, potential that has been not fully exploited by now when you can combine telescopes together and do a zoom in interferometric measurements inside, um, uh, very close to the stars, then you get up with the hotter part of the disk that you're missing here. It's essentially, it's 50k what you get with Alma, the burn of Alma here. Okay, so that is the foundation where we're starting and we are building up on that. Now, we have been quite amazingly successful in the planet catch. And I tend to say this was a really a piece of luck here in the sense that nature has been nice with us. But nature has produced way more planet than we could imagine, and even more than any sci-fi movie could imagine. So we have been better than sci-fi movie in that sense. So you've seen this diagram before, that's my version of it. So this is all the planet that we have detected, for which we have either a mass or minimal mass or size, and this is a period of the planet. 
So um, this is two different diagrams. Real data here. I'm not trying to extrapolate the mass and the size and size of the mass. I'm not like this is just the real data. Every point is a planet. So you pay attention to this diagram and you realize that um, we also have the solar system planet I added to this diagram. Well, what is quite um, fascinating into this diagram is the fact we have you go everywhere essentially here, but you have to have this kind of a boundary condition here, which is the limit of the technology we're using to do these gamma detections. Essentially the transit on one hand and radio velocity on the other hand. There may be a bit of astrometry coming later, but that's what we have right now. It's two main techniques for which we have found a lot, a lot of planets. So anything on the left side, we can find. Anything on the right side, we can't find. So it's not a surprise that we don't have any Earth right now. It's a bit more complicated than we thought, and we'll come back to explain why it's more complicated. And it's not a surprise that transit has very few long barrier of giant planet, because the statistics play against the transit. We need so many, so many stars to get one. Transit is the most inefficient technique, or really the Possibly, because you miss a lot, a lot of planet, you need to be really aligned to get the transit in. Um, you have, like, as I was mentioned in the previous talk, we have different kind of, uh, I don't really like to say, to say population, I would, I would like to say more groups, grouping of planet. Um, we have the contributors on the top, this is massive planet um, and with short periods. We have quite a substantial number of moderately warmish and Jupiter like planet. Um, not that many actually exactly similar to Jupiter, uh, but bearing in mind that's the log scale, actually we have a lot of them which are clearly way more massive than Jupiter. If somebody wants to Jupiter more, Jupiter is 10 times, 15 times the mass of Jupiter. So already making Jupiter in the solar system is quite a challenge because you need to accrete all the gas pretty quick. Making a 10 times mass Jupiter is even more challenging. challenge here. So we do have quite, quite, um, quite a substantial number of this object. And then the big surprise was this uh, population, this group of planets that we tend to call mini Neptunes and uh, Super Earth. Uh, they are sitting in a, in, a, in a regime where nobody would have expected anything because it would fit within the orbit of Mercury essentially. And we have nothing inside the orbit of Mercury in the solar system. So it's a piece of luck uh, in a way. Uh, a lot of them comes uh, um, from the Kepler missions. Kepler mission without this unexpected population would have been a big fail. But the good news is when you do something, you get big surprises, and that's a big surprise. It's such a gift of God in a way here, because we'll not be talking about we'll, this meeting will not exist without this planet. The field will be just a niche uh, a field with very few detections without this planet. So we got quite lucky that we are in this situation, so we're building on that. Of course, it twists a little bit the whole field into a series of planets that we cannot really compare to the solar system planet. That's something that we have to bear in mind. Now, what becomes even more fascinating is when you look at the occurrence of these groups of planets. So it's a big debate, and there are a lot of papers on that. It's difficult because this is full of limitation biases and threshold in, de in detections. But these are the numbers that people kind of agree with. So hot Jupiter, few percent, one to five percent, depends on the amount of metallic element you have in the stars. It's quite few. So it's a very rare outcome when you form a planet or a system to end up with a hot Jupiter. So, planet like Jupiter, 10, 20%, depends on the defining, what you say the limit in terms of minimum period and upper mass, and, but that's kind of a number. So, it's a substantial number, but that's not the majority of the planet. Well, the big surprise is essentially the other bits, which is this uh, mini Neptune and super Earth. They are more than 50%, between 80% and even more, and they come usually within the series. This is a series of planets. Now, what We've learned, and if you have to summarize uh, what we have learned in, in 25 years on our discoveries in exoplanet, is clearly the solar system is not common. That is for sure. It's not common. It doesn't mean it's very rare, but it's not common. Now, the fact we have this many series of uh, mini Neptunes and super Earth doesn't prevent to have as well for the out also Earth planet like us. So in that sense, and we ended up with a series of binary systems that essentially is fitting within the orbit of Mercury. But it doesn't prevent these systems to continue having other planets further out. We just can't find them right now. And I will come back on that. Now, what is quite fascinating here is, uh, it was mentioned before, when you get a transit, you can get the radio velocity follow-up, and then you can get the mass, you can get the size, you can get the density. So you end up with this beautiful diagram, 
that is just amazing when you think about how many planets there are in these diagrams, which helping you to do astrophysics in, the, in a way, trying to find out the nature of the planets. Density diagram here, it's the density of the, of, the, of the planet. It's very, in a, in a way, um, um, simplistic. If you think about the detail we have on the planet or solar system, it already tells you a lot. You can compare how the planet has been found um, against your expectations in terms of density. So, well, first case, you take Jupiter, this is the grey and um, the line, and you can move the mass and the size around. You will be laying along this kind of uh, uh, line where Jupiter and Saturn is, is, uh, is clearly sitting here. Um, well, it works well for Jupiter and Saturn. It's pretty clear that most of the Jupiter we have are above that. It means the density is, is less, it's weaker. They are inflated. We call that inflated hot Jupiter. Essentially, all of them are hot Jupiters. So they are not really exactly like Jupiter. So this is why they are both them. And it's quite interesting to realize that we don't know why. We don't have a good physical model right now to understand why they are inflated. There's a lot of ideas, but there's not a simple explanation. So the simplistic explanation may come up right now if you're familiar with the field that would say, oh, because there's a lot of uh, energy which is beaming on the planet, it just doesn't work. I mean, actually, it's people, pretty, uh, the people are pretty, pretty clean about that. You cannot grow the planet by just beaming on it. Um, you need to really have something going on with the planet, or maybe intrinsic to the formation of the planet. But that's still a very fascinating question. So I, the question that I heard before is what exactly we understand on the Mars Jupiter um, uh, formations. Actually, we understand enough to make sense but we understand little to predict. That's quite a fascinating element here. Is we can list a series of events that can make a hot Jupiter. No one seems to be above the other one. Um, and including the migrations or interactions or, or uh, just bad planet interactions or the effect of another star's market. Now, I will go down to the green uh, line, to the green uh, um, line here, which is Earth. It's very simple. So the one one would be the Earth. This is the Earth here. Um, and then, and then you, you do realize that we have a quite a substantial number of planets that would match the density or the bulk density of the Earth. Are they like the Earth? No. This is not what we can say. What we can say is they're rocky, because that's the only word to produce this density. So we usually call this planet rocky planet, and we do have a significant of rocky planet. Which is quite amazing when you think about that. In between the rocky planet and the giant planet, frankly, it's a mess. It's a mess because we have no idea what we're talking about. Is it super rocky planet? Is it um, water world? Is it mini Neptunes? No idea. They kind of span the regime of size for given in this mass range for a few Earth mass up to 10 to 12 Earth mass. You span the wood density diagram. And that's one of these very active fields of study right now, combining the tests and follow-up. You've seen a bit before, there's a lot, lot of work on that going on. Hopefully, filling this diagram and get more accurate on this data and find out maybe subtle detail, like maybe some part of rocky, some part you can start to see a valley here, and there's a lot, lot of detail analysis has been done on this diagram and will be done, and finding out that maybe we can disentangle some of the elements telling about the structure of the planet. So you see, we move from detecting this planet, finding this amazing diversity, to getting into the structure now of the planet, and also being shocked by the diversity we are just happening in the universe. And again, most of these planets that are not sitting at the exactly Earth locations or Neptunes, they are different. And, and that's one of the key targets for James Bryce Space Telescope, for example, and many other equipment that people are building right now to just find out. So it's a cool playground, it's a fascinating playground, and that will, that will keep us busy for definitely the next 10 years. I mean, I mean trying to fill this diagram, and a large fraction of the community is working on that. Now, I would like to come back on something, is why are we failing, or why it is so difficult to find a small mass planet? Well, I mean, I will show why in terms of radial velocity, but it's also applicable for transit, because they kind of have the same difficulty in the same, same idea. The first one is the big challenge is we're observing why are we missing the Earth ring. So the big challenge we're observing the star. We're not observing the reference. We detect this planet by observing the stars. Actually, we don't see this planet at all. We just detect the stars and we look for the impact of the planet on the star. But the star can be trusted to some extent, but cannot be trusted fully, because the star is a physical system. 
with a lot of fascinating things happening. I mean, you see the HMI magnetogram of the sun, you see the HMI dotogram, you don't see the detail, but I can tell you this is not flat, this is not a perfect flat, it's a structure here. It's a really a clear structure in terms of velocity, luminosity, magnetic field. And things can become even more complicated when you rotate the star, because when you rotate the star, you have spots, you change line, and all this comes together. So when you detect, when you measure the, the light or the direct light from the stars, or you compute the radio velocity using the, 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 line, um, the light spectrum of the star, you cannot entirely trust the fact that what you do see uh, comes from the rigid body with a flat emission. So there's a structure into that, and that's a challenge. In terms of radio velocity, it's pretty simple. This is what you need to detect a planet. Change of radio velocity with time, it's wobbly. That's what we did. I mean, early, early uh, 25 years ago, we did that with an object that was producing 40 meters per second. When you go down and down and down to the meter level, then you start seeing that, which is what the star is doing. This is not a planet, it's just a star. It's making that structure. Short structure, medium time structure, long time structure, you have everything you can imagine into that. Well, the practicality, the two gets together, and at the end you get this. This is the sun, observed a long time with a solar telescope of half north. Um, and you see the variability of the point, you see the, the, the rotation of the sun, um, and, and what you have here, it's typically a um, kind of scattering of the order of one meter per second, one, two meter per second. So there's a structure here, so you're backing with the sun, and uh, to make progress into that, it's not only about building exquisite equipment to be able to detect and to measure the radial velocity, it's also to understand what it means. And I think if you move to the, to the, to the visible light, the light uh, coming from the star, it's exactly the same. You do have also an intrinsic variability, and if you try to detect tiny transit, it could be misunderstood as a structure on the star. So that's why you need many, many transit. That's what has been done with Kepler's during a long time, and trying to multiply the number of detections by packing the noise, essentially, and beating down the noise by averaging the noise structure. So, so this is really the challenge here that we have to face. So I want to show, I mean, where the field is moving, because to me it becomes a bit of an obsession, that stuff, because I realize that whatever telescope you built, if you keep doing what you're doing right now, we will fail forever. So we need to change the gears here and to rethink the whole field. That's why we came up with this uh, idea to come up with a different approach here. It's the talent, you can have a look on the web page, I don't have too much time to discuss it, but it's kind of what I call a, a dream team of uh, different institutions, all really very, very good at working on that kind of data analysis. And we team up and we're building an instrument, very expensive, very, very precise machinery, and delivering the 10 to 20 centimeters per second, like every of these very specialized spectrograph. But we're doing something more than that. Um, building a spectrograph is something easy these days. I mean, it doesn't really require an extravagant number of, uh, of developments because we know all the tricks. Essentially, all the tricks that we, 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 I mean, we put on the table 25 years ago, well, they are the same. They just have been pushed and pushed and then to, to an extent of exquisite precision. So we move from 10, 10 um, um, meters per second down to right now 10 centimeters per second. So it's amazing to think about the field of research that have made so much progress in the short amount of time. The challenge here is you can keep measuring the stars if you measuring the structure of the stars, you, you do not going to do anything here. So the idea is to be a little more systematic and to observe the star every day as long as you can. And we do think that for 10 years, if you can observe the star for 10 years, every day or every night, um, you would make it. You will end up with a number of measurements which is way beyond anything done so far, which is more than 1,000 at the university, 1,400. The problem is because we have one telescope, one instrument, and you observe the same star every night, there's a limited number of stars you can observe. And essentially it's 40 stars. So the plan here is to observe 40 stars for 10 years and try to demonstrate that that way we can beat the noise of the structure or the variability of the star, and then we can detect an Earth twin, at least some, some planet that would be beyond reach right now, which is a system which is beyond 60 days uh, with a mass below 2-3 Earth mass right now. So this is really, really the idea of telemetry here. Um, it would correspond to about 10 times more data than what is currently done by the regular surveys right now. Um, and that's the idea. Now if it works, I think we will demonstrate that there are, uh, for, we expect to find some on this Earth uh, uh, twin planet. There's no reason why they should not have any, I mean, we should not be absolutely unique. There's no reason why. I mean, there's 
formation of planets, and it's not, I mean, it, when forming small planet, that's so difficult, so we expect to find some, but we don't really expect to find all that we wanted, but we want to demonstrate this a pathway. The idea, if it works, is to multiply such equipment on ground and a little bit of money to pave the way of the systematic uh, discovery of Earth like planet around us, to pave the way for the future. That's really the idea here of that program. Now, let me come back on one of these most successful programs these days, which is Transiting Planet. We have to admit that transit configurations, nobody would have bet on it uh, early on, for good reason, because if you consider the solar system planet, the chance of a transit is almost none. And then it doesn't make any sense to, uh, to use these techniques to systematically detect them and to measure them. Well, actually, since we have discovered a population that was not supposed to exist, which is short period, then there is plenty of way of transit. The short Earth system are very likely to transit. This is why a mission like TESS or PLATO I mean, will be very, and keep going very successful and in addition to Kepler and all the ground-based servers detecting a lot of transit. But bear in mind, we have a lot of transit right now, but this is only a fraction of all the planetary system you see. But it's a good fraction because you can use this fraction in a very clever way. We can use the transit configurations, and then depending on the wavelength you look at the, the transit itself, it gives you a different size. It's a bit like the sunset stuff. I mean, there's some light that goes cross over and the other one got diffused. So exactly the same principle. So in a way, you measure the size of the planet, uh, and then depending on the wavelength, you observe this. And if you're clever, you can retrieve then the structure of the atmosphere with some assumption on the thermal pro the pressure profile of the atmosphere. And you can also just wait the planet is behind for the eclipse. Why so? Because when you have a system with a planet, when you have a planet just behind, that's the only moment you can trust that the star is alone. There is no light coming from the planet. And then anything that would deviate from that zero point, let's say this way, would give you the direct measurements of the planet light. Either it's thermal emissions or direct reflections, depending on the wavelength you're observing it. And, and this has been very successful since about uh, 10 years. We do have a significant amount of transit and eclipse, a bit less eclipse because it needs more phase measurements, a bit more complicated to do. But with James Webb right now, with a lot of um, ground based equipment, hydrogen spectrograph as well, that can also do that in high resolutions and see through the atmosphere, I think it's extremely exciting. Big telescope is a key, transit is short lived. It lasts for a couple of hours, so you better be able to get a lot, a lot, a lot of photons during that time. So it's not a game for small telescopes, it's a game for big telescopes. But we have big telescopes, and certainly future big telescopes like ELT is, would be a fantastic tool to do that. The web, of course, and we're all aware of the excitements. And I've been told that this morning you had a glimpse of um, a web observing the Trappist system, so I'm glad, and that's just the beginning of a long, long story. And then we have, um, I think, the chance in, uh, uh, to have this aerial mission NISA. It's kind of a limited size telescope, but there's enough bright transiting uh, planet, uh, maybe not the smallest one, but certainly one that you can do a lot in terms of detailed analysis and, and, and the atmosphere. So what you get is the atmosphere of the planet. Well, for those of you that have missed this beautiful uh, data from Gemma, maybe have been seen this morning, um, I'd like to, 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 to show it. Well, the reason why I have to show it is because this is the first time I see such a diagram with a wide, wide scale. And they're very, very clever the way they did. They said just amount of light blocked. And that's what it is. And it's not a spectra of a planet. It's the amount of light blocked depending on the wavelength. That's very important to realize this. And if you communicate that kind of data to people that are familiar with that, be very, very specific. We don't measure the spectra of a planet like you do when you point a, a, a telescope or spectrograph at the stars. You just derive the amount of light block. That's it. Now, of course, if you're clever enough, you can retrieve what it means. And this is what they have done here. And then you can try to adjust well, in some cases, there is maybe one solution, in other cases, maybe plenty of solutions. That's not my field of competence, I admit, but it's a fantastic uh, field, and that is growing right now. And there's a lot of people joining the field because this is complicated to retrieve the proper data. Even if you have the right, you know, great data, it's still kind of a challenge. And we will have plenty of these in the future. So please, please, please you to use the right scale when you present this, like they did here. And I really I was pleased when I saw this data. So I'd like to spend a bit of time on a very, very special object, Trappist one. Why? Because, my God, we're lucky. We are lucky. 
because a system like that is unique because I stay away at 1.5 because uh, there is kind of a consensus that up to 1.5 Earth size we can have Earth. But after we have this regime which is much more open-minded, uh, we have a bit of everything. Um, and uh, are they really conducive for life? I mean, can we really seriously talk about life? Because people keep talking about the habitable zone for this kind of super Earth regime. Is it something serious here? So it, it's, it, it's, it's just a question uh, that we should digest and dilute, and maybe we should think about that when we address the question of life. Are we making a big mistake trying to talk about life from this system just because they kind of look like the Earth, but it's still very, very different from the Earth? So this is my second point here. Third point is that how far, and that's for my colleague, the geophysicist in the room, um, how far can we really understand the geophysical interiors of the planet? When I mean interiors, I mean volcanic activities, magnetic field, structure of the planet. Um, as, a, as an astrophysicist, we can guess, we get something about the atmosphere. I think we all convinced, well, better be a very thick atmosphere, a tiny atmosphere, would be non, essentially non-atmosphere for us. But how far can we connect the two? Um, it would be interesting to get some feedback on that. I mean, it's not obvious. There is, there is a way, there is possibility. In chemistry, I mean, of course, connect the gaseous phase with the liquid phase, so you can connect liquid and gas. You can imagine also to think about the global cycling of, uh, of if you drain, then of course it has to fall on the ground, and it has, something has to happen, so we can think about that, but it's not something obvious here. Um, we all quite often have this idea of the Earth as a template. Um, in a sense, when we build up on this question of life, we always kind of refer to the Earth of condition, habitability of this. I mean, are we limiting ourselves here? And I was glad to have a little bit of a punchline into the system by Sarah Seeger when she claimed about the possible life of Venus. I love that because it brings, whether you believe or not, the first thing has been detected, whether you believe it makes sense at all in chemistry, it's irrelevant. I think it punched the line. It just shows that maybe it's time to not get too much obsessed on, on the Earth. And Mars is cheating because Mars is seen as a proxy of the Earth. So we are cheating with, with Mars in a way because we expect it to be like the Earth. But Venus is different stories. Of course, Titan is really fun because they don't even have water and Enceladus is the same story. So something I just keep, we should keep in mind. Um, now, there's a couple of points here I feel a bit frustrated. The first one is how critical and, and what to learn from the early stage of client formations. I don't think we have that many stuff on that. It's more difficult, it's not that cool than detecting planets, but we should bear in mind that it is really essential and that makes the beginning of the story. So we have disks, but I still feel there is not enough of people pushing the boundaries of using the technology to deal, dig out into the structure, the chemistry, not on the disk itself, people studying this for as a formation and stuff on this, but really the disk as a protoplanetary disk uh, and even a bit later stage. I know some people doing that, but I think we could do way more. Of course, related to that, I mean, there is all the what's called ancillary astronomical features, the comets, zodiacal light, Kuiper belt. I think this is very, very special in the case of the solar system. We have all this stuff. I mean, this is clear, it has been used time to time, but it looks a little bit like a niche uh, program, and maybe we should think a little bit better uh, how we can use that. I know there's not a an, 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 an very high number of, of young system, but now with Gaia, I think we have a very good understanding, I think, of what is young, what is not young, and we may have with Plato a bit of understanding also the age of the, some of the stars, so it becomes an interesting, um, I think, moment to think about this. Well, uh, in terms of uh, worries, I think, uh, we have to admit we are focusing on them stars, but we have a poor understanding of the stellar flares and UV impact on planets. It's really a data, data challenge. It's not the lack of model, and there's plenty of model, but how do you test the model? The only model that's been tested is the interaction between the solar particle and the uh, upper Earth atmosphere. We have very few, actually, because we have very few data. I was shocked uh, when I realized there is only a single flare that has been detected at the same time that connects. Um, the visible, the UV, and the X-ray, only one. And we're building a good theory about the flarings and using some X-ray data, and visible data, extrapolating one way or another one. I think it doesn't make any sense. I think we should really seriously think about this UV stuff. 
We cannot build a good theory of planet and stars without seriously considering the UV radiations. And it's not a lack of content, it's just a lack of data. I'm worried because there's no space missions doing that. There is no UV. Now it's fun to go to the infrared, but nobody wants to do UV. So we should really think a little bit of this. What do we need really here? And if you need the hard UV, you need to be in space, otherwise you don't get it from here. So it's a very, very challenging moment here to think about what to do. And don't imagine X-ray satellite will give you the story because you are really, you're really at the end of a spectrum here. When you want to understand is a UV one, that's one that is really producing what you would expect. Uh, now, there's a couple of open questions, I'm pretty sure we discussed that. Talking about life, I think it's not about detecting life, it's about falsification and verification really here. I think it's a complete, complete confusion in the way we're dealing with life, and we should be a little bit careful and when, we, when we're talking about that. I know there's a couple of concepts. Uh, I mentioned this biomarker concept fooling us. I don't really feel at ease with the biomarker. I think it, it kind of implicitly produces this kind of um, idea, oh yeah, we know how to find life on the planet. We have biomarkers. Like you would have a biomarker when you look at the, a spectral line on the stars. Oh, we know there is iron on that stars. Or we know this, the star made of hydrogen because we detect the hydrogen. This is not like that. And we all know we not like that. So I think we should be a little bit careful in the way we communicate on that. I think myself, I don't use biomarker anymore because I feel not comfortable with using it because it triggers endless debate and then what is it? And you fall back, and then the only fallback position is, oh yeah, the biomarker is like the Earth. Well, essentially what you want to find is something like the Earth. It's the Earth, essentially, which I think is a lack of creativity here. So it's challenging. I'm not saying I have a solution, but I just want to mention that. Uh, and then there is something I have not really seen quite often, and uh, maybe it's just a teaser here. Um, I would be very, very, very pleased to see a paper of non, no biomarkers. I mean, could you identify the astrophysic condition that would prevent life to happen. Just prevent it. There's no way. So could you identify this? Um, let's give you an example. If we detect a planet and we say there is no water on that planet and we can make a physical model that, that conclude there is no liquid, can we say no, there is no life at all? That would be very, quite interesting because then it may be easier at least to identify the difficult case like that or the common, because it may be quite common to see a, a, a planet without atmosphere, without evidence of water. We're going to see that. I mean, water is kind of easy to detect, so, so it's certainly one of the easy features that I find. So I wanted to share um, this kind of uh, thought with you. Um, before, I think, showing a couple of slides that uh, my colleague Sasha Franz, um, I think, uh, gave to me. Sasha was planned to give a talk. Unfortunately, I mean, uh, he can't come for family reason. Um, so I've seen there is a nice poster on, uh, online, so I just want to show a couple of slides that, that Sasha. So the idea of Sasha is trying to push, to push a bit the boundaries, to move beyond, I think, uh, what we're doing right now. It's pretty clear that transit will keep us busy for the next 20 years. There's no, I mean, it's clear we, we will do, there will be more planets we detected transiting and from our stars. We, don't, we have not surveyed the whole, uh, the whole uh, sky. With Plato, we may get a little bit more, a couple of this planet with a longer period, so that would be great. But at some point, that's the end of it, and we we'll only have used 1% of our capabilities because transit is rare, especially when you move beyond 20 days, 20, 30 days. Um, and that is something we should think about it. And I think direct imaging is the only way to go, and there's many, many steps, and you can definitely think about doing some direct imaging from the ground, but that kind of will be limited to big planets or large planets. With the exception of maybe of the case of Proxima Centauri, which is a very special case. So I like the, the Life Initiative program, well, because it really pushes us a little bit beyond the comfort zone. We're not really just sitting on our um, um, desk of time and all this, and we try to think about what comes next. And the reason why uh, thinking what comes next is critical, because there's a lot of things that has to be done on the meantime to develop. And there's a lot of support, RD support, and pushing in terms of community. Think about that. James Webb is flying because the community that was keen at using HST promoted the idea of James Webb right after the launch of HST. So right after that launch, because they were fully aware it would take 40 years to get that done. So we have the launch of James Webb Space Telescope. So I think it's our duty right now to promote the idea of the next generation, not for us, but for the young people in this audience and the new generation coming up. Because otherwise it will not happen. 
It would never happen if you don't push for it. So that is really the idea. The idea is to establish a roadmap and try to get direct imaging of planets, at least of a restricted number of planets that will be lying the Earth or would be kind of acceptable to be lying the Earth. Whatever it means, and I do not have clear answer to that. Now, what I would like to say, I think we it's very likely that we'll find this planet before, and, and by the experiment I was mentioning. Not maybe that one, but there may be others. I think if it works, it will be a path where a lot of people will start doing that. So I'm not really worried about the community response as soon as it works. Uh, and there will be, this planet will be identified. So we'll be able to tell you where to point the, the that kind of telescopes. So that's really the idea of here. The idea of the life is a bit pushing really the boundary, and in that sense, it's different for you all. Life is really looking at the thermal regime where you expect to find an Earth twin, which means it is the infrared. And that's the top business because you have to go to 50 micron ish, is where you're the peak of thermal um, emissions, whether you look for Venus or the Earth or any planet of that kind. And that is really challenging because when you look at this wavelength, you have a detector challenges and you have a resolution challenges as well. Um, it's not enough um, to have a big telescope. You need a really, really, really big telescope. So the only way to do that is to combine uh, telescopes together and, and to have them flying together. This technology does not exist or barely exist. It has been tested for ESA, or I think the precursor. They will be, uh, the, I mean, I'm pretty confident that it's going to happen. There is a huge commercial push for that because with the, uh, with the rise of, um, of interest for using uh, um, space as a business case, there is a limited number of antenna you can communicate with the satellite. So this is a problem of uh, Elon, actually. I mean, there's a limitation of number of communication you can get with the satellite. So the only way to do that is to establish a communication through the satellite together. So you have to link the satellite together. So the idea of flotilla of the satellite, closely linked that operate like, uh, like cars in the, in, the, in the streets, I mean, it's coming. There's big pressure on this. So it's the same, same kind of idea. You just have to do it a bit more precisely. Space is cool for that because you can really reach this level of precision, but you're still dealing with a telescope size significant, two to three meter class, operating together and combining all the light together. So it is today a challenge. You don't break the law of physics when you do that, but you may require kind of the, the top high tech of the technology. So it's interesting also for some of the space company to do that. That's really the challenge of um, of life. Um, the good, um, the good, sorry, the good, uh, the good. I mean, the good outcome of that is the interest for this mission has been recognized by ESA. I know NASA has really set that as a goal, and uh, they more want to do for I think uh, baseline right now, but it's fine. I think all of it makes sense, I and mean, they're not looking exactly at the same stuff. But I think has been identified as 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 key. But it's clearly too big for ESA. We have to acknowledge that. But certainly it could be significant mission that ESA could push and promote, and maybe find a partner later on. You see, we're talking about 2050, which essentially telling you it's likely to be 2080, so it's kind of time scale we're <laughs> talking about. That's why. The only question is, what are we going to survive after there? That's really the sort of question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's fine. I mean, science is built on their own pathway. Now, when I get asked about this kind of time scale, I feel really at ease because my comparison is always to go back to the basic and talk about the beginning of the people that started to break the atoms. These people and Rutherford in the lab, 8080 started to build this experiment. And now we are 100 years later, we are still doing the same stuff and just a bigger ring. Uh, and we're still digging out into the origin of the matter. Uh, so, 100 years, I think, is, is a good time for, I think, maturing the field, and that could end up, I think, to me, to be similar to something like the Sun Ring or, or any of these massive accelerators, that would be the same kind of scale in terms of big science um, that you can address. So it's okay. Um, first time was in the 90s, and, and 100 years later, if we have this equipment that match exactly the same kind of uh, time scale uh, that people are going to, have been going through um, studying the matter. So in a way, we say the matter is the life, and it's just a continuation. Of the so it's okay, uh, but it's just to bear in mind that if we don't push, our community, the people in this room, it's not going to happen. So, so this is really something 
that um, we should just uh, bear in mind. There's a nice poster, and uh, I'm pretty sure there are some people from, from Sasha's team here to ask uh, questions. I, I don't know the very details uh, on this, but I just love uh, this program. Now, I would like to come back on, on just a concept um, that has been my, um, in the last couple of years, I've become way, way aware of, uh, um, of the field of where the field should be going. And, and I, I realize, I mean, gradually, so I cannot talk about the planet if I don't understand my own planet in terms of geophysics. So I've been learning a lot about geophysics. And I love this diagram because it captured in one slide the challenge, what we're talking about, and it built the connection with the astrophysics. So this is a typical story that Earth scientists are telling you about um, the origin of the Earth. So you start at the bottom, you go uh, clockwise, you assemble uh, the Earth, then you start to lose the light gas, and you sink the heavy um, element and it produce the core, and a lot of CO2 uh, falling and carbon falling, because all these comets impacting a lot of carbon and carbon, which is good, I mean, falling onto the planet. Part of this is Thing sinking into the planet, and then the light cools down, it moves from this lava surface to uh, something a bit cooler, solidified, and then you exhaust the CO2 that used to be captured inside, get out, and then you start the volcanic activity somewhere, I'm pretty sure Nick will talk about that tomorrow, but better way than me, uh, and then you build up the planet, and so at some point, in the case of Earth, you reach this kind of magic of the prebiotic element, and then you get life, and life is completely changing the atmosphere again. So what is interesting in this picture, and that's, I want you to remember if you're familiar with that, the Earth doesn't look the same in time. It's very different. It's very different at the beginning and the course of the evolution of the Earth. This is changing, and that's the case for any rocky planet. You have this change. So when you connect that to astrophysics, then you can produce the equivalent spectrum. You can, let's imagine you can observe uh, the Earth at different moments. You will get a rather different spectrum, very, very different spectrum. Same planet. Well, in astrophysics, we have the privilege to pick a lot of objects with a different time scale or different structure. So I think, in a sense, we will be doing that. We'll never be doing that the same way than the model, but at least we will be addressing the data challenges. We will collect data. But what is fun here is we have planets which are locked in in some of these phases here. 55 Cancri, for example has a planet, which is so close, it's a rocky planet, the surface of the planet is like a lava. So it would, it would match a bit the stage, early stage, when the Earth was in that similar stage. It's interesting to compare some model that people were producing about what kind of exhaust you would produce at that stage on Earth and the one you get in, in 55 Cancri. Because of course, 55 Cancri will be observed, is being observed, and keep being observed, because it's transiting every, every day, essentially. And you can really study what you see into the atmosphere of, of this system. Well, you can move a little bit later into this process and look at a warmish planet. In that case, you could detect a planet which may be relevant for habitability on life, but who cares? I mean, you will be matching maybe the early stage and uh, this kind of arc and earth equivalent, because some of the planets are maintained there, they are too close to the star. The star keeps maintaining the planet in a kind of a thermal regime that maintain the planet at a level where it never cools. So this is exactly the kind of element here you can do. And what is great in astrophysics, technically we have an unlimited, unlimited number of targets. It's not true because we still have to find them out, but there are really a um, couple of hundreds of systems that will be worth to be studied and to be compared to that. And that is for me the key of the game, I think, is trying to combine the great detail you get from anything you do in the solar system with a very blurred perspective you got, you, you're getting when you observe the new planets and you try to match them together and try to develop a story. So this is something I realized, I had the chance to join Simon's Foundation Collaborations and Dimitar was a very uh, vivid promoter of the idea and I was absolutely convinced that's the way to go. Uh, on, that, on that element here, I just want to end up with mentioning two initiatives going on. Uh, the first one is in the idea to bring this field moving forwards, I'm convinced it's not really only a scientific fund of challenges, it's really an interdisciplinary challenge we're talking about. And that becomes fascinating because then you start to become, let's say, doing a psychotherapist. Because you are trying to bring fields that are used to talk together together. 
and you start to hit the kind of walls of the different departments and rules and uh, finance uh, and the way the, uh, the funding agency is being set up and when you ask for something it has to be fitting exactly that kind of topic and there and the problem of that field and as a challenge I'm sure we all have faced one day or another is sometimes we're a little bit outside the boundary conditions uh, where we operate and that is a challenge here so to solve, I am absolutely convinced, to make progress, to make significant progress in that direction, so we need to deal with that. So we need to establish what's called innovative collaborations, we need to break apart the system, we need to change the way the academia are being organized, in a way that they authorize this kind of uh, flexibility. It means flexibility of teaching, exchange, and co-professorships, all these elements together, when you can develop this kind of curriculum. Um, so we have been lucky, to, um, uh, with my colleagues in Cambridge and ETL Zurich to reach that goal. I know there is other activity, other, other similar activity. I'm, I'm inspired by Dimita activity um, and Hanava. One of them is the Eleven Home Center for Life in the Universe. So you can have a look on the website if you want. There, was, there will be a lot of opportunity if you want to visit and to engage with the center and even opportunity of funding later on we offer. And, and the other one is the similar, similar kind of program being set up at ETA Zurich, which is um, the Center for Origin and Prevalence of Life. Um, and that's also doing the same kind of different um, initiative. And there's a couple of my colleagues here and that are also part of this, both centers uh, that we'll be able to describe. So just watch out what's going on here. Uh, you may want, and I hope we will inspire the center to be developed. We want we, to demonstrate is, is, is it works. And uh, I'm very happy to talk um, further about this, and I'm more than, more than happy to talk to my colleague Tosca, um, um, co-leading the, uh, the centre um, uh, in, in Cambridge. He's around here, um, and if you want to have more detail, and, and visiting us as well. I would like to just end with an opportunity, you may have seen it. We uh, have started uh, the, the ETA Zurich with, uh, with the fellowship programme, which is now live on air. So uh, just be aware, and um, if you are a young, uh, willing to engage into this topic, there is an open call and you can apply for, for working at ETR, which is an Omis Foundation ETR fellowship. That is open right now. So you just Google on the uh, COPL and you will find out. And it's until 10th of December, so you're more than welcome to uh, join us if you want to get into this field. So on that point, I will stop here and maybe answer some questions. Thank you very much. It's always the same. I mean, you have a limited number of slots, you have a limited number of expertise, uh, and you have a kind of ranking list where you want to start with. Now, this being said, to address the UV challenge, you don't need such a telescope. You can do that with a much smaller telescope. So, I really invite people to think about uh, using this agile program that they are, exist, the ESA exists, and ESA. there's plenty of agile programs like that. When Lactas and Test did it in a way, it was fantastic. I mean, cool in a way, the way they did it. A very successful mission um, um, to think that way. A great mission, big mission, we need that, but we have a limited number of slots. So at some point, we need to think about exactly what we want to do with that. And maybe these two missions will have to coexist because they have a different background, maybe they will need to be merged. 
anywhere, given the story of James Webb and the cost history of James Webb, we still there will be a challenging moment here for the community to come up with the next generation. So, but if you don't ask, you don't get it. So I, I don't really, I'm not worried about the fact that it will take some time. We should just make sure that everybody should keep asking. If you don't burn the door, you will not get it. And some of the community are way more organized than us. And this is for historical reason, and the, the cosmological community are very, very um, um, unisized because they are in the same field, they are usually, they know each other, they're very, very much aggressive than the exoplanet community, which is a bit younger, and no needs to team up with outside, I mean, expertise like uh, geophysics and chemistry. And that is the weakness we have. And one of the purpose of this center is to rebalance that by developing a new curriculum in a way that there is a strong community. I think at the end, we will prevail because definitely this question goes on the top. I mean, you, have, you cannot deal with the origin of the matter in the universe without dealing with the origin of life. I mean, it's certainly at the same level. So we will get it. But we don't stop. I mean, things take time. We have to accept that. <laughs> And we're not in a too bad position, but we have a, quite a large series of instruments to play with. So, community is quite busy for the next 10 years. Hi, Chris Sanchez of the University. First of all, great, uh, thanks for the great talk. It was very interesting for me. I have like, two questions. Um, while we were going over the 10 questions that we had towards the community, you mentioned uh, biological markers and non biological markers. So, my question is uh, when we have, because we have the precision we have in our solar systems, could we say we observe such biological or non-biological markers that could confirm either the presence or non-presence of life? Can we say, like, can we observe Venus and say for sure there is no life? Or can we observe Earth and say for sure there is life? There is. You know, that, that's a question I get quite often. And, and, and again, my, my, my usually not a worries of the following. The first one is, if you, if you look for a copycat of Earth, you may get lucky or not. Uh, and then if you find, I mean, if, if you know exactly what you're looking at and you try to make a match, it's like a patch filter. Um, and of course, if you detect a planet which is exactly like the Earth, you could conclude that there is life. But frankly, is it really a sound I mean, assumption to make you will find a planet exactly like the Earth? Now, the problem I have with this, with this assumption is we have a planet almost exactly like the Earth, Venus. And it's a completely different atmosphere. So I know I tend to remove the biomarker, the biomarker from my scope. And I would not say I don't care, but I don't care that much about the biomarker. What I do care is, can we say something about the atmosphere of a planet like the Earth, or in the mass of the Earth, the size of the Earth? And the challenge right now is, no. Because in transit, we barely do it. You cannot find an atmosphere of 20, 30 kilometers when the planet has 6,000 kilometers. We can barely detect a planet already in transit. So it never doesn't work. So whatever you can talk about, you can talk endlessly, it will never work. And, and then you have the sentiment ratio challenges as well, because transit is so short-lived compared to the rest of the time and nothing is happening. So we should admit that essentially the transit is very unlikely to tell us anything sensible about life on the biomarkers. That's really the, my statement. Again, we may be surprised, and science is full of surprises, so I'm willing to be surprised. But that's my statement. And I do think we have to think about the next step. But already, being able to tell something about the possibility of an atmosphere, or maybe a very thick atmosphere, or the diversity of this many super-Earth planet, would be already fantastic. Because it would help understanding the formation of the system and with the assumption that the nature of the atmosphere of this planet has can retain the information, which is half true. Um, you have this is valid for a giant planet because to change to retain, I mean, to change the atmosphere of a giant planet, you can't really change it that easily. <coughs> Neptune, you may. You can imagine you bring a Neptune and you bring it closer to the stars, and then there is something happening because you lose a lot of the atmosphere, and then the atmosphere you have on the planet doesn't tell you the story of where the atmosphere, all the atmosphere was at the time of formation. So the connection between the formation site of a Neptune and the way you observe it, it's not straightforward, I think. So we have to be a little bit careful, a little more bet on the giant planet for that. 
but for sure it was a geophysical event and then you would completely change it. So it's always a lot of caution, so that, that's why I don't really like biomarkers, because I think people imagine these biomarkers um, related to the Earth. Now what I like is simple questions. Is there an atmosphere? Would be nice to know. Well, of course it would be at the limit. Is there water in the atmosphere? You can even go, is it oxygen? It's fine, I'm not, it doesn't mean it's life, but is it oxygen? Um, is there whatever, CO? Is there, and on and on and on. And I think this we will gradually be able to do. And we will build up the momentum here, keeping in mind that eventually one day we may have so much evidence that something unusual is happening on that planet in terms of geophysics that the only way to make sense is to add a bit of spice and say, oh, maybe there's some kind of organic activity there. So that's my view. But again, um, in, this, in this business, I'm at the end of the process here because you have to decide. I mean, it's, I'm too old, anyway, because it's going to happen in the next 20 to 50 years. So you will decide how this will go. Not me. Maybe it's just complete nonsense what I'm saying right now. <laughs> you will tell me that I'm completely wrong. <laughs> Hello, Trifon, Max Planck, and Sophie University. Um, as we know, instrumentation of astronomy is very expensive, right? Because it's unique. It's all prototype. You can just go and buy it. But if you build copies, as we said, the price decreases significantly. So now you're building uh, Hams 3. Uh, but I'm a little, how to say, not concerned, but I'm a bit nervous when I hear, for example, a sample size is 40 stars. So this is this very risky project. Yeah. It wouldn't make sense to build Hams 3, Hams 4, Hams 5, Hams 6 and also two meter class telescopes and make an array uh, of, uh, of this kind of identical instruments and study, let's say, 200 stars, but you have much better chances yeah. to visit So, I tell you my plan. So, not sure I will be able to achieve it. I think my plan. So, um, you're right. I would absolutely agree with what you said. I think it doesn't make sense to reproduce HALPS. HALPS is a very expensive project. The reason why we did it is because we trust the system enough that we can apply it to a telescope of 2.5 meter, and we can we hope to demonstrate that it works. Right now, unfortunately, nobody has been able to conduct such a program that way with an instrument that delivers 10 to 20 centimeters. So I think before you start building up a network, as you say, you have to demonstrate it works. So that is really my goal. Of course, to demonstrate it works, you better have results. So my hope is we will find one to plan it. But you're right. It's very frustrating. So after that, we should develop a network. Now, there's a couple of ideas right now, what you do exactly what you said. Um, to do that in a bit of cheaper way, with maybe slightly smaller telescope. I mean, the, the cost of the robotic telescope has decreased dramatically right now. So building a telescope of the 1.5 meter class right now is nothing like it used to be in the past. If you find a way to build a machine and replicate the machine that get similar results than half stream, and, and there is ways to do that, and we kind of study it already that kind of program right now. Then you can multiply maybe and have 10 telescopes doing that, and then you have 500 stars. So my point is, I think we should end up with 5 to 10 telescopes, uh, with the concept that each of them would cost 10 million, and at the end it would be 100 million, which is peanuts compared to the price of the life of a new world. But until you convince funding agency to support this, you need to demonstrate it works. And this is the trick. It's easy to get, well, it's possible to get one million when you are PR, maybe two million, you get it. Three million if you're really good. 10 million is tough, because you're right in the middle of the dead zone. Well, it's kind of easier to ask for 100 million, actually, because then you build up a massive project and you get big agencies. So, but then the problem is when you're sitting between these two, you don't really, you don't, you have, it's difficult. I, I, I told you to establish a program at I get exactly a lot of reactions like you. It took me five years to convince the community to do that because it doesn't make any sense. Well, in the 90s, it didn't make any sense to look for plant biodiversity. They even people that look and wrote, wrote paper, but why people are doing that? They're wasting their time. They should do astrometry. Without talking about transit, no one would do transit. It doesn't make any sense. But if they would have known, they would have found a planet 20 years ago. I mean, in the 80s. I think technically, planet could have been detected in the 80s if you would know they exist like that. Um, so, 
you know, it's always the game, it's always the chicken and the eggs. Um, I still believe 100 million is nothing compared to the cost of a, a typical instrument, a major instrument on the LT is its cost. And that's very low compared to a space program. So I'm trying to embed that kind of cost into a massive agency program um, and for the next 20 years. And again, my time scale is 50 years here. So I think it may work if we can demonstrate we can detect planet by velocity. The challenge here is we can't fail because if, if Terminating don't detect an, a, an Earth planet, I think we do for the next 30 years because it means that the best machine in the world, the best team in the world, fail to detect that planet. It means they're very rare or we're really hitting something very hard here and we may need to do direct imaging search for planet and that would be really tremendously difficult. So that's a kind of interesting moment for the field. But I'm kind of optimistic. I can't believe there is no plenty of Earth waiting for us. We just have to look for them properly. I'm Janet Alfon from Bulgarian Academy of Sciences History Institute of Astronomy. Uh, my comment is on one of your points when you were talking about challenges. So you said uh, we still don't know enough about stellar affairs and stellar activity. And that's completely true, especially in the UV. Uh, and even the models now are not perfect. Uh, and I think that maybe one of the, coming back to your next point, the synergies and working together is again the planning missions and instruments and things like this. The first thing is think about the star. Because based, based on the star, you can um, have the planet evolution will go different ways, the planet habitability can go different ways, and things like this, and uh, not just their from mass ejections as well. This is what we're lacking. We're completely lacking there, understanding what's happening. So... Yeah, uh, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, the thing is we need that, that data as well. So. Yeah, I would agree. One question. Uh, Where are you? I just can't see you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. Uh, Ivan Pucciaro from uh, Quantum Electronic Departments of University. Uh, thank you for all the things that you summarize. Uh, from some point of view, I didn't find one interesting uh, point that you, I would like, if you have the time, to very short to uh, comment. Because uh, the question is very complicated, it's clear for all of us. But uh, anyway, if you're looking for the life, you have uh, three major uh, elements, like uh, Earth, Sun, and planets. And all of you that discuss, uh, of course, we agree that uh, Sun is important to see how this is related to the planet Earth. Also, geophysical points is also important because uh, there is not only the electromagnetic point, there is a hundred of flux from protons that kill the life, and you need some uh, geophysical processes that are important to keep the life. However, I didn't find any explanation about uh, planets, some of the planets, not Earth, but I mean the solar uh, system that can uh, relate it to keep the life, like in the Earth. Yeah. And this is an important point for me, can you comment? I think, I think you're right, and there's a couple of uh, questions which is in the same vein that what you mentioning here. I think there is the assumption that life started on Earth and then life is there. Maybe not, maybe life started and life stopped, and we started and stopped, and we started and stopped until they find a way to continue and then to really I mean, go over completely the surface and then inside the, the Earth. So that's the idea of the upper mountain. Maybe life started on Mars as well. Maybe life started on Mars and moved to Earth and flourished on Earth. And maybe life started on Venus and moved to Earth. And, and then these planets evolved and Mars lost atmosphere and Venus maybe lost water. And, that's, and maybe Venus never had water. And then we don't even know ever if there has been life on Venus. I think there's a long list of questions you can ask. And unfortunately, the challenge here is nowhere to get any answers because this question has been not going blooming around for 
years and years and years and years, if you have no data, what could you say? And everything is gone on Earth. It's not gone in the sense it's kind of erased. Um, we have this fascinating moment, and Nick will discuss that tomorrow about bringing some of the more. So that's really a big change because this will be telling us something that we would have dreamed knowing years ago already is what could you say about the early history of Mars and is it relevant for the origin of life on Mars as well? So the key here is moving to um, a debate to a um, fact-based comment. It's very gradual. It's going to take time. And um, we may be overwhelmed by the data. Maybe we will not understand the data properly. We're going to find oxygen and water on some of these planets, and we say, oh, there is life. Actually, we completely fool ourselves. Maybe there's a complete other reason for that. That's fine. At least we have data. And that is really what's happening. This is why I think there's so much excitement right now. Because you can compare with data. You can argue forever, but the data will stay. So that's a moment. So I have not any answer to your questions. I have just added even more. But hopefully, with the um, data coming in the next 50, 100 years, we will have some answers, hopefully, and maybe even more questions, maybe, very likely, like it is the case in, in, uh, in science. So that would be my take on that. That's wonderful way to finish today. Let's thank Didier for a excellent talk. Start and this time we will talk about planets and planetary science.